All right, recording is in progress. So with that, Patricia, Patricia Kong, kick it off for us. All right, hello. Oh, I'm sorry, there, there's a lot of things happening. Um, my pleasure to being here today. And I had said, Tom, to, to thank you for having me. And I am still so surprised. Um, you know, we've been kind of in, in the pandemic for, God, like 17 years. And people are still really wanting to, to learn and attending these. And I still get to uh, learn from everybody else and fill my juju with um, understanding what's going on out there. So today for this event, um, for those of you who are here, I'm gonna have a, a, um, a little bit of opportunity for us to interact through, um, through, through the conversation, through my presentation. Um, but one of my understanding is Tom, uh, people are gonna be muted. Uh, I'll build up some, some time at the end for us to, to, to have a conversation. I have some ways for us to, to get started on that. Um, but when we we're talking um, a beginning, in the beginning about what this, you know, this, this Agile conference was gonna be, Tom had mentioned um, really thinking about the, the notion of curiosity and the curious agilist. And so I have actually been on a uh, deep rabbit hole of thinking about curiosity and, um, and I'll tell you why. So um, I've been working um, a lot uh, in the management consulting space and helping um, some of our, our, our professional scrum trainers at scrum.org really look into you know why agile what are the things that we're trying to do what's the vision all these different things and then when you start to talk to companies or even some people about their goals um they'll go eh, i don't know or eh, like just just tell me what would you do and tell me how to measure it and tell me how to all these things and i was like where where is the curiosity in that when we become agilists you know what has happened there and what is the environment that surrounds us but Curiosity is something that's super interesting in general to me, just because if you think about it on a grander scheme, it's probably what got my parents here from Hong Kong, uh, immigrated here, and it's what got someone like me to jump off a building in New Zealand for fun, right? So there's things like that and those behaviors, and what does that mean for us as Agilists? So about me, my name is Patricia Pong. I'm from Scrum.org. I lead our enterprise um, agility endeavors. And um, I'm a co-developer of the Nexus framework for scaling Scrum and the evidence-based management framework. So how do we manage based on evidence um, in organizations? And I spend my time thinking about the kind of envelope of the organization. So the things that the teams do, we can help them thrive and also find that goodness in the rest of the world. Um, organizational behavior person and over a decade learning agility and Scrum backed into it the same way a lot of other people did, which was uh, through paint. All right, so Boston, Paris, Boston, uh, I do speak French and I also speak Chinese. So scrum.org is the home of Scrum. Uh, we're founded by Ken Schreiber, who is the gentleman in the top right-hand corner. And we are a mission-based organization helping people and teams solve complex problems. That was a really good looking picture. This is really much more what we look like now, which is just, everywhere on the world, you know, looking at our cameras. All right, so diving right into it, curiosity. So the definition of curiosity is a strong desire to learn or know something. And um, the first thing that I'll say is that when, we're, when I was looking at that, I wanted to understand, is curiosity something that we all have? Is there, there's sometimes people are just like, eh, I'm not interested. And what I found was that um, from Cardiff University, uh, it's in the, the UK, and they study memory and motivation um, in the labs, they find that people are all similarly, similarly, similarly <laughs> curious, but, <laughs> but they're <laughs> similarly curious, but it's the personality that actually drives us to be more curious about specific things or situations. Um, so there's, there's essentially these curiosity types. Uh, the first one, there's three, um, there's, they're developing other ones, but there's three main ones that I'm aware of. And the first one is epistemic curiosity. It's just acquiring new information, right? Go down that rabbit hole. We're going to study, study, study. We're going to look at this. We're going to read a lot of articles. Um, then there's social, social curiosity, which is why do people think and act the way that we do? And I would bet that a lot of us in the agile space are, have a lot of social curiosity. And then there's perceptual curiosity, which is people who try to go out and really experience things. So it's that type of curiosity where I want to experience things, I want to 
I want to take things in. And that would be like your friend if you're on a walk, the one who's, who's like this, just looking at everything. So that's that type of curiosity. And I thought that that was really interesting because when we think about that and we think we're all baseline in terms of curiosity, it brings us back to who we really were as children. And I think it's so interesting when people rant on about, you know, my husband saying, oh, five whys, Jeff Bezos. And I said, ah, oh, isn't it funny that the five whys, this management technique of, you know, root cause analysis is, is just what children have been doing forever. So um, what they know is that at the age of four, children ask about 300 questions a day and they're unafraid to ask those questions. So no, the why, 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 right? What about this? What about this? But what, um, we, what we found is that, or what we found, what the research shows is that as kids start to go through school, that why question becomes um, less and less and less apparent and it goes down to almost zero. And about the time that they get to high school, age 14, kids are not asking any more um, really exploratory questions. They're asking more practical questions, practical questions like, can I go to the bathroom? Uh, will this be on the test? So what they're trying to do at that point is because of school and these institutions and how we're supposed to behave is getting into our brains. The exploratory side is replaced with trying to figure out what people want from us. And of course, as you become a teenager, you're trying to figure out how to go around that system maybe, but it's really trying to figure out what authorities and people and our parents want from us. And what we see on the other hand too, is that on the other hand, people who are in authority or our parents are usually um, asking questions. When we start to ask questions, um, maybe to teenage children or you know, to, to maybe some, a junior person who's on our team, we tend to ask them something that we, we usually know the answer to. So again, we're tapping this sort of exploratory thinking and we're not really encouraging it. And what that really emphasizes is this notion that we should be limiting our curiosity to practical concerns. And our job, this, this notion of the job that we have is to figure out how to play in the rules. And for me, this is really compelling because I remember growing up, if I asked a question, the answer was always no. And I really grew up in this culture of, you know, you should really only be talking when you're, 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 you know, I'm asking you a question to respond to. So I grew up in that kind of, you know, very traditional environment um, for, for my background. And um, somebody must have allowed me to do something because I obviously ask a lot of questions if I'm going through this as a talk. So, okay, cool. We were, are curious by people that starts to get stifled, but does this really matter? Does this really matter for organizations? And does it matter in general? So I'd like to ask you to explore this with me. What behaviors might happen when we are not curious, not? And what you can do is go to menti.com, M-E-N-T-I.com. I don't know, Tom, if you can drop that into the chat. And then there's this code, it's 95389778. And we can start to see what we're responding to. So what behaviors might happen when we are not curious and just enter your responses in there. And hopefully that's going to work. I did put it in the uh, chat. So. Awesome. And it's coming up. So I'll give you a minute for that. Stagnation, misunderstanding, disengagement, <laughs> mediocrity. Gosh, mediocrity is very funny to me because I think that sometimes a lot of, uh, in our industry, there's a lot of people in the biz business of scaling mediocrity. Anyways, stagnation, lack of innovation, stop learning, depressed, right? Those are huge things about behaviors that can happen when, when we're not curious. And so we're losing that childlike behavior and that's really interesting. For me, when I thought about this question because I was thinking about if curiosity is important, what would happen if we weren't curious? And I wanna tie this into 
there are probably times when we shouldn't be curious or, you know, when we have to think about risk, right? There's, there's the notion of that, you know, curiosity killed the cat. Um, there's, there's this curiosity and then there's like, what will happen if I throw the cat out the window? You know, that kind of curiosity that's a little bit dangerous. But the, what I'm looking at and thinking about is when we are not curious, I think that what that allows to happen is that we make a lot of assumptions. And there's this notion of judgment that comes into play, but this notion of uh, uh, making assumptions is what can uh, help, what enables organizations to put up blinders. So uh, thank you for, for sharing this and I'll make sure that, you know, um, I'll put this in, in some sort of um, format for, for Tom to be able to share later. So, all right. Now that we're thinking about what would happen if we weren't curious, if we're thinking about that and we're not curious, does it matter? And the answer, as we just kind of felt through is of course it does. And so here are three areas that I was looking at that I thought was really interesting of why it would matter to an organization. And the three areas are uh, professional growth, right? So how is curiosity a fundamental for professional growth? The future of work, what does this mean for organizations and how we start to sustain and thrive as organizations in the future? Um, the future of work is also interesting because um, I used to work in forced research and at forced research, one of the biggest threats they talk about at future of work is artificial intelligence and machines. Um, and then the third part is as we start to think about it, how can curiosity help us? We start to look at the relation of what it does in a neurological way and how that's related to the learning, um, learning memory in the brain. And that has a really big component in terms of society. So I'll keep on going. Um, and at the end, I'll have five, five things that I think are, are suggestions that we can do. So the first thing of why it does matter. What we see is that curious workers more often look for ways to grow in an organization. And that means that naturally what we're doing with our teams, what we do with ourselves is we're asking, you know, what went wrong? What was, what's, the, what's some feedback that you might have for me? What can I do uh, better? And so those are people who are looking for more opportunities and they're looking for more ways to grow, learn different things. These people are generally reading a lot. Um, so they're trying to do different things. But what we find is that in an organization, when people were asked, so this is over 16,000 people in a study done by Spencer Harrison and John Cohen, um, what do we think about in terms of future-proofing companies, right? What do we need to exist for, for future-proof companies? So we already understand that there's a lot of growth for people who are curious. What are these important characteristics? And what you can see is at the bottom, oof, curiosity got 5%, right? And I link curiosity with innovation um, and just lots of question asking and all those things that we know. But there's communication, commitment, self-motivation, professionalism, passion, awesome things. Professionalism is part of the brand of Scrum.org, right? What does it mean to be a professional? How do we improve that? The problem is that I thought was really interesting is that when you are locked into those characteristics on the top, a lot of those actually reinforce status quo. It creates this kind of echo chamber of how we think in an organization and says, we must be this way, right? So think about those clicks in high school. We're gonna act this way. But nobody's curious about why do we do that and what could be changed. So what does this mean? Well, I think that that's an interesting thing to just say, what is valued and why should we value it? Then there was another discrepancy that was found when they were looking at this. And when I think about this in terms of future work is that of those 16,000, more than 16,000 people that were interviewed, when they were asked, is, is curiosity encouraged at your company? 83% of top executives said, Yuck, yes, heck yeah, right? But then we can see that 52% um, of individual contributors were like, no, no, it's not. And I think that that, when you think about that, um, is obvious why, right? Because top executives, you can ask questions, you have the authority to do so. When you're asking questions and you feel like it's not your place, there's a lot of risk associated with that. 
So how do we do that when we're looking at organizations and we're thinking about this? Um, well, I think the interesting thing here is not obvi that obvious notion, but the fact is that the executives thinks that curiosity is encouraged. And so this perception, this gap, um, shows us that curiosity is valued based on, based on your role in the organization. And what it points out is that the same rules don't apply to everyone. And this has me really thinking about, this had me thinking about how is curiosity related to privilege? Where does it mean, is there privilege in the workplace about what we do? Is there privilege in society about what we're allowed to ask questions and how do we fix that? So the, how do we fix that? We let executives know that, no, curiosity is not a safe, is not a safe thing in the organization. Um, another thing that was interesting was executives perceived that curiosity was linked to compensation. The more curious you are, the better you do, you must get compensated more, but that's not, it's not incentivized and that was not what, um, individual contributors thought. And what happens now, if you think about it, is that, oh, okay, so top executives in management, curiosity is a thing. It's a thing in our organizations. Um, we get to be curious here. This is really valued. What happens is that power and innovation gets locked, right? So I'm talking about the organization and this is all this thing about like, oh, let's change the culture. The, the power gets locked up there because of this perception. And what means is that the things that we think about in terms of empowering teams, this disconnect, there's this huge disconnect because when we think about actually innovation, uh, in my opinion, and what evidence actually shows in agreement with my opinion, is that fostering curiosity at work leads to people who are more deeply engaged with their work, right? We talked about not being bored, those things, and it creates ownership. So um, in my opinion, beyond that, it also is probably where valuable ideas are coming from because it's the people who are close to the work. And the other thing about why, why is there misperception, I think is super interesting. And it wasn't about um, safety, actually. Why do executives think that um, you know, curiosity is, 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 is allowed, but the same rules aren't there for people who are actually doing the work. And it's because of a lack of transparency. It's because when we are curious and we ask a question, we may not get the real answer. And so it's not worth my time, right? So that's a really interesting um, thing that I think is happening. So there's a lot of barriers there um, and a lot, of, a lot of different things that are shown through their research. Now, from scrum.org, I think somebody um, is unmuted. The, from scrum.org, we've been running our own data uh, with, with agile teams and scrum teams. And we're doing some um, survey work with McKinsey and this is ongoing. And in the bottom right-hand corner, there's actually a link to the survey if you'd like to, to participate. From the hundreds of people that we've been surveying, we saw some of, um, when I started to look at my data and look at this data, it was interesting because I saw some of the same discrepancy and I was trying to figure that out. And what this says here, you can see 63%, when it's specified team members are empowered, team members are empowered to decide how they'll work to sort of their goals. It was 63%, 41% felt that they were empowered to challenge the goals, 61%, are reporting status updates on their work. So this is all around, you know, can we ask questions? Are we empowered? How would we challenge this? Um, what does this mean? How will I do the work? You know, thinking about that and that ownership. All right, so this probably isn't anything new, but the thing is, is that when I look at the other questions that we ask, the big one is um, your team. So a person in a different role has a clear understanding of who they say are they're delivering value to. That was 92%. So when we asked management those questions of what they thought, you know, do the teams know what value is? Do they have ownership? Da, 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 da. It was 80, it was 83% and above. They started to see that kind of stuff. So we see the same thing in the teams of where we of where we have those things. And when we talk about in our in our industry, it's all about empowerment. So that gets me thinking about some of the stuff that I, I research um, for evidence-based management is to look at this link between the things that we do, how we're, how we're measuring that in terms of success and what actions and behaviors that might lead to. So 
the thing that will be interesting is if we backed into it and we said, we want to create curiosity as a behavior, humans are complex, but if we want to do that, what types of goals and measures would be there or how would we express those goals and measures? And I bet you if it's get this feature done and your measure is velocity, how fast you are, that is not the behavior you're gonna get, right? So we start to think about those things and this relationship between the goals that we have, what types of goals they are, how we're deeming success and what behaviors that might create. And does it create the, I'm just gonna be quiet and um, move on. One way to get curious from, from the evidence-based management framework is, is how I start talking to teams, is to look at key value areas in an organization. So current values where we are as an organization, um, that allows us to pursue unrealized value, that untapped market, those new ideas. And we can do those things if we look at our ability to innovate, can we actually pursue it in our capability and look at our time to market. If you are sitting with your teams, one of the things you could do is think about where are we most focused? Why are we most focused there? What would happen if we were only focused on new things, on realized value? And there are companies that are doing this um, and risking their current customers and they're risking even their ability to do it. So they're trying so hard to pursue new things. They're just creating a lot of debt, technical debt. What if we were only focused on our time to market and we shine that sneaker super, super, super bright, you know? Well, is that even valuable at, at some point to anybody? Those are questions that I might start examining for how are we working in an organization and what could we do to open our eyes to be more curious about why we're doing things? And then when I think about that and those goals that could create that behavior, I think about the notion of what we do and what we breathe as Agilists when we think about inspection and adaptation, there has to be a curiosity there. There has to be a curiosity for us to want to adapt. There has to be a reason why. So I think what I've seen a lot in terms of organizations is they espouse to Agile and Puricism and all those things, but I'll, I don't really see this notion of inspection and adaptation. So um, this I call the magic wand graph because I'm not super creative, but it means that we understand where we are. We're looking at that. We're looking at the goal. We're making that transparent so that we can ask questions and come up with ideas of how to do that. This should, this should look very similar to the Kata model uh, with some ways that we talk about it. And this is in the evidence-based management guide on scrum.org um, if you'd like to learn more. So what are, what are some things that I think um, as Agilists, we can really do, and we can harness and enable curiosity. And the researchers, they had um, a framework that they have, and they think about the four I's, which is they think about identities, how do we incentivize, how do we integrate, and how do we look at the intersections? For me, when I think about this for us in organizations, um, it's very much the same. I think we should be curious about learning and iteration. So foster learning um, that fosters exploration ideas and information searching. So what that means to me is um, it's probably not going to be super helpful if you go for scrum.org what we see. Uh, we're going to take the IT department, that division of 500 of them, and they all need to pass the PSM1. That's not fostering learning. It's not creating any sort of exploration. And I think this is super important for me also because, as I said, Curiosity is what helps learning and from brain science, it what helps it um, sit in the brain. And so for me, when we think about kids and especially children in um, underserved communities, that notion of how to engage children in learning is super important so that they don't drop out. And how do we think about that and create curiosity in that way is just something I'm also passionate about. But it's, it's really when we think about you guys all must do Scrum, you must do Agile, go past the assessment. That's not really creating anything that helps people learn. There's different ways that you can think about that, community practices. Um, the way that I think about it, Scrum.org is how do we keep our classes um, something that will help people really simulate what, they'll, what they would think about in real life, how they would respond um, in an Agile mindset. The second thing is ask why and help others ask why. So obviously, you know, say, oh, what's important is, you know, questions that you ask and ask powerful questions. 
I want to make sure that when we are using, let's say the scrum events or something on a cadence that we're not listening just for those status updates, but that there is curiosity and that there is a, you know, why are we doing this? What about this way? That there's really this, this generation of ideas, the retrospectives that, you know, that, that happen or don't happen. That's a really great way to think about what do we need to do to improve? Um, if you are okay with getting doors shut in your face, ask somebody, why are we doing agile? What is, why, why are we pursuing agile in the first place? Cause that gets lost, right? Cause it gets trendy. The other thing, third thing is to value curiosity. So bridge that curiosity gap. Think about ways that's incentivized. Is it, is it, there's an interesting project over here that we, we participated in. What does it mean that we need to kind of open the eyes in two ways is that executives and management thinks that curiosity is okay, but the teams don't, and it's because they don't get the real answers. There's a big question there around transparency that needs to be looked at. And so for me, one of the ways to do that is to get those goals out there, goals of the organizations. How do we start to pursue those things together and understand transparently what that success is? So that kind of goes back to that goals, measures, behaviors diagram I showed. Um, embrace your own curiosity. So, um, you know, you might be like, at work, I'm kind of in a square, but like, I'm also a hip hop dancer on the street, so on the side. So, you know, there are places where people, they have one identity that they present at work. And then there are some other things that they do. And what happens is that for those people who feel like they can't get curious, they are definitely curious as a parent, as somebody in a hobby outside somewhere else. And uh, what the research says is that you need to, you need, to, you need to say that's okay. We need to authorize that that is something that's okay. And we can bring that personality or that curiosity into other dimensions. And the fifth thing is really to lean in, lean into uncertainty. Uh, we're curious by nature. It can be tiring. Doors get shut in your face. People kind of wag their finger at you, but lean into it. Understand that this is the way of the future. And for me, the reason that I think this is so important to help is because there's a lot of things that are going on in other dimensions of society that I look at where um, there are some really smart people, especially children, kids, children, are they children anymore? People from the ages of 13 to 20 who are looking to solve really interesting problems, right? Why are there one to two baby deaths a week um, from sleeping? You know, there's climate change, there's all sorts of things that are happening and as a society, where we're moving toward is that people are going to be in organizations that thrive in, in issues that help society and things that help um, green issues. And I hope that we can create an environment that does not stifle, um, stifle their desire to learn and to help, but to really encourage it and to create those great working environments um, as Agilists that, that can help them. Um, because that would be amazing. Their interest is not only about that growth mindset of learning and, and, and thriving, but really the benefit mindset of helping everybody on the planet. So thank you. That's me jumping off of the building in New Zealand. I don't know what I was thinking that day. Um, you can get in touch with me at patricia.com. It's from that org, uh, LinkedIn, if you uh, would like, and just let me know. Um, where we engaged, but here's what I'm gonna do so that we can start to kick off the engagement is um, I would love to know. So go back to menti.com and use the code that we had. And I would love to know what, um, what insights did you have and what are you curious about now? And I'll have to say, I didn't really know how to drive this question because I wanna know what insights you had from this talk so that we can engage, but I also really wanted this to be impactful. Like, what are you curious about now? What, what might you um, pursue? So just take some time and I'm going to put that up on the screen and you just have to go to menti.com and we can have a look at those responses. Oh, the code is 95389778. It's the same one as before, right? It is, yeah. Okay, yeah, I posted that in the chat. Awesome, thank you.
feel like we should turn this into a class now and I'll go into breakout rooms and answer each of these questions. Talk about these questions. Yeah, those are good questions. These are excellent questions. So I can answer, um, or I can give a response to the three types of questions of curiosity that I mentioned in the, the beginning which is uh, epistemic curiosity. So that's just con consuming facts and concepts and um, different, different knowledge. Social curiosity, it's you know, interpersonal stuff, people. And then perceptual curiosity is taking in the things that are around you. So taking in information from experiences, maximizing your sensory responses, those type of things. Um, so those were epistemic, social, and perceptual. All right. Um, so these are here for us all to look at. I'm around uh, and I'm happy to take questions if you'd like to unmute yourself and, and ask, or we can, we can kind of talk about some of these here. So would you jump off of another building again, or is that out of, out of the realm of possibility? One time is enough. Um, I'm, I would really like to actually jump out of a plane now. I might be having a midlife crisis. <laughs> uh, that was just something that, um, that was just something where you think about that curiousness. So um, probably about 15 years ago, 10 years ago, there was this show uh, that was called The Biggest Loser. And I don't know if people are familiar. And there was just this episode that I remember where one of the things that they got to do was they went to New Zealand and they had, it was, they jumped off this building. And it's really like, it's in a building in the center and they're hitting a target. And I think it was because they had to weigh a certain amount. I happened to be in, and I told myself at that point, if I ever go there, that's the thing that I'm going to do. I don't know why I would associate that in New Zealand, but I was there for work and um, I just went, oh, well, I'm here. I'm going to do that. And the funny thing is, is when I went up, no fear, not at all. But in the video before that picture was snapped, it was like it hit me what I was doing because I was free falling and I just start hurling. <sighs> and then it's like, Oh, and then I kind of got my bearings together. Um, so that lets you know the type of person I am. So um, let's look at some of these things. How will di dynamics change once we get back to the office is something that's super interesting in terms of partially, you know, back in the office or not. Um, I don't know if you guys are experiencing that, but there's just so much that has to be balanced. And I know that when I have done um, some stuff around the future of work, there's so much when we come back and, lo and loaded and what that means, because there's this dynamic about coming back to the office. Also, how do I, how do I as an organization value my employees' mental health? how we participate in social injustice issues. And they're very different, but they're all intertwined because it's about how much do you care about what I care about? And there's some people that, for instance, um, if they say, no, you need to be in the office now, I definitely see a lot of people who are applying for an organization for roles, rescinding them because of that. You don't care about me. Um, I want to do that. There's, on the other hand, people are looking for our remote teams, are they okay? Because we used to be kind of anti that, right? And, and they would say, what is agile? What does evidence-based management say about that? What does Ken Schraber say about that? And I was like, well, we're not Jesus Christ. I don't know, but if it's working, then is that okay? And can we just figure out those type of ways and think about that time in the office, you know, what else we can, we can use this for because that time for, because we know that people have been able to do amazing work at home. What should that time be used for, um, for now? Uh, when we are together, what would benefit? You know, so is it brainstorming conversations, talking about some, some difficult topics? Um, all right, so let's look. There is an interesting one that I saw, and I'd be interested if whoever asked or somebody has a thought about it. 
Curiosity is also different in cultures. Do you have any research, in, research highlighting that? I have not dug deep into research um, in terms of different cultures, but I, um, like I said, I expressed, I'm, I'm literally come from a culture and it's my own family's culture too, where it was like, you know, children should be seen, not heard. Why are you asking these questions? And I remember, um, <laughs> this has been, I've had a year of coaching, two years of coaching going through this. I remember being curious or actually wondering, why am I like this? Why can't I just, you know, kind of ride the wave? And I don't know that if it's, you know, culture might do something, culture is man-made, but scientifically we're all curious and how we express that will come out in different ways and how it gets authorized. And is it okay to be curious? Is it, is it not, has been interesting. But what I have been kind of going down a route is, is, is curiosity a privilege? Is it the people who are trying to survive and thrive? Do they have that time to be curious? We know about, you know, Holocaust survivors who said, you know, when I was in the concentration camp, what I had to do was there was something that was happening to me and I had to make a decision to perceive it in a different way. You know, so there's that sort of stuff where we know that it, it relates to a decision. So being curious or allowing curiosity, it allows for a decision. But honestly, you know, when someone's just trying to survive, do they have that privilege to be like, what if, you know, I have, I have no clue, which is something that I'm interested in looking at. The, the, uh, the flip side of that, so we saw that privilege is related to, you know, when you're an executive and you're in power, you can ask questions all day because nobody's going to slash your neck. But the, um, the thing is, is that is if it has to, you have to look at the other side of that, which is, is privilege something that we can attain? Or is it something that should be dismantled? Which is, if it's something that you can't attain, like I could never be, um, you know, a white man with blonde hair and blue eyes in, you know, corporate America, is is that is that what it means that privilege can't be attained? Or is it that you know I'm first generation Chinese, I have these things, I have a certain socioeconomic status, I have I'm educated, you know, are those different things that can't be attained? Anyways. I'm rambling now, but I thank you for these questions that you have listed and these insights that you've had here. I'm sure you're not looking for all my answers, but if you'd like to engage, um, feel free to reach out. I hope this sparked something in you that will empower your own curiosity so that you can be a happier and more engaged version of your already awesome super selves. All right, thank you so much. Thank you, Tom, for having me. Thank you, Patricia. We appreciate your time. And everyone, please feel free to, um, we have another live session come up in a little bit, but we appreciate Patricia's time and her questions and things she shared. So it's great to have her with us here on the Agile Online Summit. Bye. Thanks, everyone.